Good day, Brigade. This is Bobby coming at you with another episode of the Mongoose Brigade. Today we're going to be talking the Ukraine-Russia war. Yep, we're finally going to take a dive into that a little bit. We're going to be looking at some of the more recent events and news and all that, plus discussing a little bit more on what's been going on. Making a joke, making a laugh at our initial estimate of hoping that this all would be done in May. <laughs> ah, that was hopeful. Anyway, before we get started with that, we'd like to uh, tell you a, well, I guess a crazed anecdote is probably the best way to describe it. From Georgia senatorial candidate Herschel Walker. The man who's had his brains literally scrambled from playing a career of football from high school all the way up to his retirement. And now, in spite being able to speak a coherent sentence, as you will soon find out, he's decided to run for senator in Georgia in order to help some orange asshole try to hold on to some political relevance. So. In the words of Herschel Walker. And they've been saying, something is better somewhere else. And I'm here to tell you it's not. So I've been telling this little story about this bull out in the field with six cows. And three of them are pregnant. So you know he got something going on. But all he cared about is keep his nose against the fence looking at three other cows that didn't belong to him. I'm going to pause for a second. Part of the reason why it's so weird on how I'm stunting and speaking this is, one, I'm reading it, and two, Herschel Walker is really this bad at English. He really is. Anyways, now all he had to do is eat grass, but no, no, no. He thought something was better somewhere else. So he decided, I want to get over there. So one day he measured that fence up and he said, I think I can jump this. So that ne- that day came where he got back, where he got back. Yeah, like I said, doesn't make any goddamn sense. And as he got back and as he took off running, he dove over that fence and his belly got cut up onto the bottom. But as he made it onto the other side, he shook it off and got so excited about it and he ran to the top of that hill. But when he got up there, he realized they were bulls too. So what I'm telling you, don't think something is better somewhere else. This is the greatest country in the world today. Yep! That is something that a legitimate senator for the United States Congress has said. Someone who wants to be an actual senator. Look, Georgia, I'm not going to judge you on your own personal political beliefs and affiliations, but for the love of fucking Christ, do you really want this ignorant asshole representing you to the rest of the country? Is that really the message you want to give us? Oh my god. This isn't the only crazy shit he said. We've actually got a full database just sitting here. One day we hope that if they ever do rebuild the Georgia Guidestones, instead of putting all the weird, creepy eugenics crap that they had on there, We can just put Herschel Walker quotes on there. And my god, there's a treasure trove. I highly suggest you look him up. Anyways, on with the serious stuff. So, as we mentioned in our little earlier segment there, before we got into a little bit of what the fuck fun... We said we were going to be talking about Russia, Ukraine, the war, and all that. So, if you haven't been quite keeping up, first off, where have you been? Under a rock? Second, there's been quite a bit developing in the recent days. Russia has announced that it has captured eight people, has arrested eight people in supposed connection with the destruction of the bridge between Crimea and Russia. There has been Ukraine denying that flat out. There's before that, the fact that the bridge was blown up in the first place. And before that, there has been Ukraine 
kicking ass and taking names. I'm, I'm sorry. We try not to be biased on this, but my God. Russia, you fucked up. And we're not trying to take a biased approach to this. Strategically speaking, Ukraine is doing fantastic. The reality of it is, though, they do not have the means to keep continuing forward too much further. And they have to start holding out for a bit of a defense to cover the ground that they've gained. This is our own personal idea on that. That is not the actual strategy on the battlefield. Keep that in mind. We are not at all uh, currently, I don't, currently on the battlefield. We are nowhere near the battlefield. We are not a part of the Ukrainian or Russian go- governments or militaries. This is merely our own speculation based on events that we know. Should also be mentioned, and this is probably the detail you know more about, is that as a result of the destruction of this bridge, Putin himself, well, not himself, but Putin has carried out several missile strikes on civilian targets throughout Ukraine, many of them being cities, like Kiev. Sorry, I most likely mispronounced that. So, as we could tell, the current status on the ground seems to be Ukraine's kicking ass, Russia's kind of getting a little angsty about it, Putin has already said he's going to threaten to push the button, so to speak. And a lot of people are like, really? There are definitely people legitimately afraid, like Elon Musk, for example, who has shut down Starlink satellites towards the Crimean region, because he a bitch! Uh, Again, we have no sympathy for Elon Musk. He is a total bitch. Also, his pro-Russia peace plan... Complete and total garbage. Just garbage. But we have re- we've heard from many, including political analyst Ian Bremmer, that yeah, Elon Musk has deliberately shut down Starlink satellites, and thus intelligence towards the actual new front line on Crimea have been a bit hampered. However, recently, like as in yesterday. G7 members have decided that they are going to provide air support and air defenses, well, not air support, but air defenses for Ukraine. In addition to this, Germany has gone as far as to offer an air defense system that they themselves haven't even deployed yet. A very cutting edge technology too, no less. And that the entire G7, excepting I believe actual Russia, (laughs) has decided to say, uh, yeah, you need to withdraw. And they do. So, naturally, it's been a long pain in the ass for that so far. Ukraine is coming ever closer to Kherson, which is the regional capital. We've called the region Kherson in a previous episode. We'd like to apologize for that. They have not taken the entirety of that region, nor have they taken the capital city, Kherson itself. And I don't believe it's the actual proper name for the region. And that is, again, our bad. It's a lot of stuff to cover, and when you're one individual doing all this research on your own, it's, it's easy to make mistakes. So, where do we stand strategically? Right now, we're kind of in this shifting of Ukraine finishing its counteroffensive, and re-establishing a new defensive line. Russia is pretty much in a similar boat. They've been reeling back from that sudden strike and are now regrouping and building a new defensive line. So, in terms of that, we're coming to yet another phase in another action. What will happen? It's hard to say. However, many speculate that Ukraine will probably keep making gains and keep pushing forward, and that Russia is going to become an increasingly desperate situation. And this is where Putin's nukes kind of become a problem. Because it's hard to say what Putin will consider his do not cross this is Russia line. Does he consider it the Crimean Peninsula, which Russia illegally annexed in 2014? Or 
Is it actual Russian territory? Or is it this Ukrainian-occupied Russian illegally annexed territory that belongs to Ukraine rightfully? Or is it just an arbitrary thing that he's decided and he'll launch them whenever he wants to? Or is this a complete and total bluff? Personally, I'm in the camp of this is a bluff, but a bluff with some teeth to it. Now, he's not going to go full-on nuclear strike. No one's that stupid. To do so would result in a response in kind, and that's just game over for everyone. It would defeat the main goal of Putin, which is to hold on to power. Right now, which is something he is very much struggling with. Which is actually why many speculate that he's launched a series of missile strikes over the past two days on various civilian targets in Ukraine in order to try to quiet down the criticism of his war within the oligarchs. The reality of it is, is that while damaging, if anything, this move has done the exact opposite of what he's hoped for, at least in terms of what it might do for the West, and has maybe garnered minuscule praise amongst the oligarchs. Keep in mind, this is a situation that, oh boy, is a very tough and tight one. Meanwhile, the U.S. is saying that Ukraine's likely going to war into the winter. And to that, we're going to have to agree. This war is easily going to go into winter. Will it go an entire year and past? Well, at the risk of sounding like a dumbass again, we're going to say that the war's not going to go much past a year, if at all past a year. At this point, the security action has failed in, per in perspective of Russia. They've had to initiate a draft, which many outright refused, so far as to many of people of Russia immigrating out of the country and trying to find their way out and evading the draft to where only the incredibly inexperienced and old were really drafted. Also, fun fact, did you know Russia actually has a larger proportion of women than men? And this is actually due to the fact that they've been through a series of multiple heavy, harsh casualty wars. It's very common for the Russian grand strategy in terms of combat to use high casualty strategies. This is not necessarily the wisest move. Historically, it can have a very serious intimidation factor and has. But nowadays, it kind of loses it, especially with modern battlefield technology and tactics. But... The high casualty count still seems to be there for Russia. And that's why there are actually disproportionately more women than men inside the Russian Federation. It is because of wars. On the inverse, China actually has more men than women. And I think we all know why. One child policy. But China's not the topic for today. However, China and India have quietly called for Russia to de-escalate the situation a little. Now, of course, they haven't really come out and properly announced this, and there's a variety of reasons for that. If you're wondering why India, by the way, there's a reason for that. And India is historically seen as the premier third world country. And third world in this context meaning countries that are not aligned with the United States or, in this case, the Russian Federation, historically, the Soviet Union. But that's why India. <laughs> because India is kind of the not really, but kind of ish de facto leader of this group. Though again, to suggest that they're any sort of unified organized group is a bit inaccurate. Because while they do unify and work together on stuff, on some things every so often, as a whole, the non-aligned movement isn't really an organization as much as it is as it says in the name, a movement. But, let, let's stop talking about the past for a second and speculate. If this war to end, say, let's say by some miracle this war were to end today, and that miraculously Putin and Zelensky got together and hammered out a peace deal, what would we most likely expect from a peace deal? Well, our belief is that at 
absolute 100% best, the maximum both sides are gonna get out of this is white piece. Now when we say white piece, we mean a piece in which nobody really gains or loses anything. You know, excepting people. <laughs> and the reason we believe this is because while Ukraine, while Ukraine is certainly strong enough right now to hold off the Russian forces and push them out of their land, if Russia chose to escalate this, this would be a serious problem for Ukraine. In addition to this, Ukraine cannot effectively launch a good counteroffensive into Russian territory. As much as we like to all hope that they could and believe that they could try, the reality of it is it's incredibly unlikely that they'd be able to pull off anything like that. Not without some sort of heavy military assistance from other powers, which would mean other Western powers getting involved. Which would mean Russia would escalate the war, and well, we all know where that goes. But, don't take this white piece as something that's just, oh, well, there was nothing, no point to all this. Because there would be serious, serious impact. Now, when we say white piece and nobody gains or loses anything, we're gonna say we're gonna say this again, or say this because it's a bit different from what you might expect. When we say nobody gains or loses anything, we're including the Crimean annexation of 2014 in that as well. Russia will not gain Crimea. They will not have Crimea. They will not be allowed to control Crimea any longer. Now, you might be thinking, well, is that really white peace then? Because this war began back in February. And to that, we argue, yes. Because while the proper war itself didn't come about until February, Russia has been deliberately ratcheting up tensions ever since. And this forced concession can only be considered a part of that. Just like how Nazi Germany managed to seize the Sudetenland through appeasement, but then later had to give it back after they were defeated in the war, we too believe that Russia should be forced to give back territory that doesn't belong to them if they fail miserably in their freaking imperialist action. Did we just compare the Russian Federation of today to Nazi Germany? Yes. Did we do it in a way you expected? Probably not. <laughs> but this white piece would be very important. Why? Because in Ukraine, it'd be chalked up as a win. You, got, you held on to all your territory, you defended yourself against the Russian invasion, and you're still alive. That is a win. <laughs> not only that, but Ukraine never expected to have to fight Russia, I'm sure, back in February, and even so, I don't think they were exactly looking to take things from Russia that didn't already belong to them initially. So, you know, white peace in this case would actually be, you know, a victory. Not the greatest victory, not the prettiest victory, but a W is a W and you should take it. Now what will this do for Russia? Internally, many might see this as a failure, especially on the part of Putin. His action didn't go through, it failed miserably, and things were destroyed and lost. A lot of the economy was sunk into a war that ultimately did not pan out to achieve anything, and the once proud military prowess of Russia has been openly humiliated by Ukraine. Things don't look great if you're Russia. <laughs> now, would this lead to Vladimir Putin being forced out of his position? Not likely. Would this likely lead to the oligarchs to start looking for a successor silently? Almost undoubtedly. Personally, we'd be surprised if they haven't already considered the possibility of a successor. And probably have a shortlist available. Why? Because, in spite of recent days, so far this war has been a total and complete bust for Russia. In fact, they've been failing heavily on lots of freaking categories. In terms of providing a sufficient offensive, failed. 
in terms of holding land, failed. In terms of not having desertion, failed. In terms of keeping the domestic support high at home, failed. All around, complete and total failure. However, Putin still has some men he can blame on this. And it should be noted that very recently, they have actually changed the commander of who's in charge, the command of who's in charge right now in the war in Ukraine, and they have chosen a man who has been less than affectionately dubbed General Armageddon. Now you might be wondering, who the fuck is that? And why does he get such a badass name for being such a horrible person? Well, we're going to tell you who he is, at least a little bit. So, the guy who goes by General Armageddon is a general of the Russian Air Force who made his way initially quietly up the ladder and then made big waves in Syria by bombing the ever-loving shit out of civilians. We're, we're not exaggerating here. They bombed the ever-loving shit out of Syrian citizens for Bashir al-Assad. It is just appalling. And this is the guy that Putin has now put in charge of the Ukrainian assault. So, are we likely to see more airstrikes and missile strikes? Undoubtedly. Is the G7 response to provide greater air defenses to Ukraine a good one? Oh, hell yeah! That's probably the best option you have right now, because he's gonna be an incredibly, incredibly difficult fucking asshole to deal with. However, if his focus is mostly in air, the ground game might become a little bit easier, especially if Russia can be prevented from having air superiority. Keep in mind though, just because he's a general of the Air Force doesn't mean he doesn't know how to command an army. Rather, just his specialty relies in air units, not ground units. So, can we expect to see a lot more airstrikes, unmanned drone kamikazes, and all that? Probably. Are they going to be successful, and is this going to change anything? Probably not. And the reason for that is, unless Putin acknowledges the level of power he has to put into even having a chance at winning this war the way he wants to, He has to escalate the war to a level he's just not willing. It's just not going to be in their best interest to continue this war any further. And realistically speaking, Russia needs to start be willing to negotiate. And unfortunately, with Putin's reputation as a strong man, that's going to be a very tough sell. However, there might be a way to de facto end this war without necessarily a treaty. And this third in this option is probably the last option people would want, but probably the only option we'll reasonably get. Unless Putin negotiates. And the third option here. Yeah, besides the obvious two, one side winning or white peace. The third option here is to basically go Korean Peninsula with this shit. In that Ukraine pushes the Russian forces out of its borders, but doesn't advance further and prevents any Russian incursion from coming further in. Eventually, the Russian military will either have to continually exhaust resources and escalate the war, or simply put the war on hold because they cannot continue. This is not the ideal way to end the war, but it is a possible way. 
in this, Ukraine would have control over its territory. It would be very difficult in a very tense situation the entire time. But they would have control over it. Russia could continue in theory to claim that they're ongoing the war. Not great. But in terms of their propaganda and rhetoric, it'll at very least not be a total loss. The problem with this is... It'll only create another potential flashpoint for a serious global conflict. And quite frankly, we got enough of those in the fucking fire already. Let's not throw another one in there. Alright, if you're still listening to us at this point, thank you. We understand the difficulty in talking about this situation, and we certainly did not cover it as much as we'd like to. There are still so many little details that can be gone over, like the fact that the prisoners Russia has arrested in, quote, connection with the destruction of the bridge to Crimea. This is what we're calling it. We're not giving it its proper name. It doesn't deserve that. It's an illegitimate bridge. Sorry, but the eight individuals arrested for allegedly blowing up the bridge were five Russians, two Ukrainians, and one Armenian. And according to the FSB, which, if you don't know, is basically Russia's equivalent to the CIA or any major intelligence agencies if you're not an American, claims that these individuals started from Odessa, Ukraine, drove through several countries with 22 tons of explosives, drove it onto the bridge after all that, apparently, and blew it up. Now, you're free to believe what you will on this story, and there are definitely a lot of questions still flying around about this. Putin himself claims that it was a rush, was a Ukrainian strike. However, Ukrainian securities are suggesting that, A, no, it wasn't them, which... Honestly, if it was them, we wouldn't be too surprised. But if it wasn't them, again, also wouldn't be too surprised. Would they even have the capable means of doing so right now? And two, based on the information that Russia has released on one of the individuals, it appears that not only is that individual completely innocent, but the entire destruction of the Crimean Bridge seems to be a false flag operation. Now, for those of you who might not be familiar, a false flag operation is when, under the guise of another group, organization, or individual that one is trying to start hostile relations with, one deliberately attacks and or sabotages their own infrastructure. Or what have you, because there are plenty of other things aside from infrastructures that can be included. Now the idea of the false flag is to try to create a justification for attack, strike, war, whatever, whatever really you're looking to do, under the pretense of, well, they did this to me. Now, we're going to post the little post that the Ukrainian intelligence has released explaining their whole debunking of why they genuinely believe this is a false flag operation. And honestly, with the details they go about and go into, it's like, yeah, they're absolutely right. And the photo itself, we did actually check and... Yeah, they're right on where the source seems to be coming from, too. So we're going to leave that on the page for you if you want to take a look at that, and we highly recommend that you do, because Ukrainian intelligence also has a link to other information that you might be interested in, in terms of disinformation being spread by Russian media. So if you want to check out the Facebook page and find out more on that stuff, we recommend that. To finish it off today, though, we're going to leave you with another Herschel Walker quote. And my God, is it going to be a doozy. And here it goes. Well, you know, you've got to pay tribute to the 9-11 victims, you know? But also, you saw America come together. You saw America come together because this country was... You know, it was on a war with a country that didn't believe in us. 
I'll let that one sink in for a second. <laughs> And right now, we have leaders in Washington, like Joe Biden, doing venomous speeches that doesn't believe in American people. He's trying to separate us. I'm running against Senator Warnock, who's another one that says, white people gotta apologize for whiteness. America gotta apologize for it whiteness. You're trying to separate people because you look at, you're looking for a vote. That's why I've been encouraging people, getting out and campaigning, letting people know that we not, we're not racist bad people, that right now, We've got to come together. In follow-up through that quote, which is also technically a part of the same speech, in the Bible it says a house divided cannot stand. And that seems to be what Raphael Warnock and Joe Biden want us want to do is separate the people. I can't even begin to go into the ridiculousness of that all, all that statement, but feel free to pick it all out. For example, like how a house divided cannot stand is, fun fact, not from the Bible, but a quote by Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> or how none of the sentence of, and right now we have leaders in Washington like Joe Biden doing venomous speeches that doesn't believe in American people. We can only guess that he was talking about Joe Biden's straight up counters and warnings and well let's say for what it is attacks on MAGA move MAGA movement within the Republican Party that that's what we're guessing he's going for and if you're curious Senator War Raphael Warnock is actually the incumbent candidate that Herschel Walker is going up against right now pollings have them at a dead heat my god and the reason why a lot of people are watching this race is many analysts believe, and at least based on statistical data that we found through using 538's little mechanic here, which is really fun, we will post a link to that as well, that many people believe that this race is pivotal and will determine pretty much the entire outcome for the midterms. Why do people believe that? because as much as we'd like to deny it, there are trends in voting, and trends that seem to favor one way will tend to create this sort of cascading effect into other races. It's really fascinating. Anyways, that's our show for ya. If you liked it, share it. If you hate it, share it. Regardless, share it, because if nothing else, there's some pretty ridiculous Herschel Walker quotes you can listen to. Anyway, those who wish not to be tread on should mind where they step and have a great night and a pleasant tomorrow. Please check out those links later.